Thank you to everybody for joining us today. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm the vice president of the Guild, and I want to say on behalf of the whole organization, uh, we're looking for the silver linings of the pandemic, and this has been one of them, as we've created ways to stay in touch, to learn, to inform, to enjoy, to entertain. Um, there are more of these in the pipeline. We are working on them. We are planning for them. We have a summer series coming up, and if this is your first time joining us, thank you. If you've been here before, thank you for coming back. I'd like to say, because there are more, if you're a member of the Guild, then you receive a newsletter keeping you up to date. And if you are not a member of the Guild, I would implore and invite you to join. Uh, the great thing about our organization is there is a seat at the table for everyone. So if you're a working music supervisor, depending on where you are in your career, we have a place for you. And if you are someone who just has an interest and a love uh, for what we do or works in an adjacent area to what we do, we have Friends of the Guild, a subscription. So we won't shut the door on anyone. So if you like being here and you want to continue to be here and you want to stay abreast of everything we're doing, please join. Um, now I'd like to hand it over to uh, music supervisor, independent film producer, Filmmaker, the man with the mic, the man with the plan, Jonathan McHugh. Thank you, Madonna, and welcome everybody back for our summer series. Uh, looks like we have about 300 folks so far in the building, so thank you guys all for coming. And thanks to our panelists for uh, signing up to be here uh, to uh, give some information about uh, their shows. Today's focus is on the shows of HBO. I spent a lot of my time watching HBO. The quality program is ridiculous. And um, these are just four of the, of the great shows that they have and, and four of the supervisors doing some of their work. So we're going to jump into it and just going to read some brief bios on my people. First up, introduce Keir Lehman. Uh, Keir started uh, his music supervision career at a shop called Hit the Ground Running, which is another one of our great supervisor outlets. Worked on hundreds of episodes of TV, including... CSI franchise and, HB and HBO's Entourage, which was a bellwether for getting my, wanting my son to be an agent. So now he's at William Morris. So thank you, Keir, for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in 2008... Ari inspires us all. Yeah, exactly. 2008, he moved to Sony Pictures, got some corporate experience, <clears throat> and went back out 2013 after five years and opened the world of independent supervision, which is own company, Bad Sneakers, where he's been killing it. Um, uh, he's worked on everything, shows HBO, obviously Fox, ABC, Lionsgate, Sony. Uh, some of his shows, other shows include Black Lightning, Truth Be Told, a little film called Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which had a killer soundtrack, uh, Queen and Slim, which I love, and he's got the upcoming sequel to Space Jam, uh, and the upcoming Sesame Street movie. Can't wait to see those. How are you today, Keir? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out. And Jen Malone, an Emmy-nominated music supervisor, has done such great work uh, as the show Atlanta, another tremendous music show, Boomerang, uh, the film Creed II, which I loved, um, Step Up, High Water, Baskets. I uh, started a career actually in, in PR, which I did not know until Mark Cates told me that, Jen, believe it or not. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, we go back, we go back a long time. Uh, worked for bands like Nine Inch Nails, Portishead, Chemical Brothers, Marilyn Manson, Prodigy. Um, and they worked on just all sorts of amazing uh, independent companies uh, and labels. So she's made the move to L.A. years ago, and the supervision is full on into it and crushing it. Welcome aboard, Jen Malone. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Um, Blake Lai. Blake, make sure I got that pronunciation right on your last name. Uh, it's Lay, just like Lay. My butchered it already. Good start right there. Blake Lay is a composer, music supervisor, music producer, and sound designer who lives in Harlem in New York City. Born in New York, raised in England until 15. Uh, he worked in post production sound and music for 30 years. His sound credits uh, include films by little known directors like James Cameron, the Coen brothers, Spike Lee, Ang Lee, the Lee brothers, I should call them, John Waters, late Jonathan Demme, Julie Taymor and many more. Um, he's music supervised and composed all five seasons of HBO's acclaimed David Simon series, The Wire, plus my favorite, one of my favorite shows of all time, I guess because I went to school with Tulane, was Treme, 
uh, which I want to talk about a little later. But he has uh, composed musical scores for more than 20 feature fil films, including many award-winning documentaries. Welcome aboard, sir. Wow, that makes me feel really old. Thank you. And, you know, <laughs> some stuff by now, pal. Nothing to be ashamed of. Um, Liza Richardson. Hmm. Known her for a long time. Uh, first as a KCRW DJ. I used to love listening to her shows. She morphed very nicely into working on some of my favorite shows like Narcos, Leftovers, Friday Night Lights, working with Jason Kadem, who I believe gave you your first job in music supervision. Is that true? First TV. First TV show, right. Yeah. Um, and you're still doing the KCRW, right? Yeah. yeah We're yeah. on a little break right now because of COVID, but yeah. Don't lose that one. That's, that's great. We love hearing you on the radio. Your silky smooth voice is so awesome. So, <laughs> Lisa Richardson, thank you for coming on the GMS first summer panel series panel. Glad so, to be here. Thank you. Um, we are going to talk about these shows and some of their other work. We're also going to uh, try to show a clip of each of their work, but there's obviously internet latency out there, so it will be could be a little janky. So we're only going to show. We're not going to show the whole clip, just a little bit of the clip. Uh, to give you a flavor of what these folks do. So going around the room, um, just starting with, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we'll start with um, Kier. So Kier, uh, here's a couple questions for you. So your show, again, was a show that I was really turned on to my, my older daughter, where my younger daughter turned me on to Euphoria. It's good to have kids as a &R, TV and, and music a &R people. Uh -huh. Um and so my oldest, 24, just loves this show. And she's like, you know, all in. And what I love about the show is I started watching with her. And much like I did with another show called Sex Education, I just love watching these shows with the miracle of Shazam in my hand. And I can basically, you know, because TV is not exactly good on letting you know what credits are on. You know, it's just they don't even use music credits pretty much. You're barely lucky if you see your friend, the supervisor's name as they blitz by at the end. So the Shazam has really enabled me, especially on a show like Insecure, to get turned on to all kinds of different musics. And which, as a supervisor, you're always looking for where that next music's coming from so you can know about it, be educated about it, and, uh, you know, just make sure that you, our world as supervisors, just knowing, sponging as much as possible and knowing about music. So my question for you is, uh, Issa Rae, obviously, she came to our award show about two years ago, I think, our Gilda show. Yeah. One of the greatest quotes ever. And it was basically like, my shows don't exist without my music and my music supervisor, which I think I added to the sizzle reel because it was so powerful. So <laughs> talk about right. the and minuses of working with such a musical showrunner because, you know, she's so deep in the streets that she's created her own label and she's got her own label deal with Atlantic and she's got a whole company that she's working on. You mm -hmm. talk about, but for me, Again, it's a blessing and a curse because I remember uh, a number of years ago when the EDM boom was in full throttle, I did a movie about uh, with a, a Mexican director shot in Puerto Vallarta where a lot of EDM, we hired EDM GJs like Steve, uh, Steve Aoki and uh, Chris Lake. And, and so this music, it was, he was so all about this music at the time. Um, and he was a kid who would you know, come up going to raves, working at MTV Mexico City. And he was deep, deeper in the culture than I was, let's, so to speak. So I spent like, you know, I, I spent the weekend going to Electric Easy Carnival and saw the sun come up two nights in a row, three nights in a row, and had to learn and immerse myself into his world because I was not as up to stuff, snuff. And as a music supervisor, that's a difficult place to be. So talk about you and Issa and how you work with the music and how you be so deep in. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a good point that you make and that sometimes you're, you know, working on a project that's maybe not, um, you know, musically the genre that you're most familiar with. And in those cases, you know, I mean, for me, I just love researching music anyway. That's what I would be doing if I was doing this job. But that, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to make a career out of it. So, you know, sometimes I am in that situation where I need to do my research and, and learn more about a certain genre. Um, fortunately, uh, in this case, it was a pretty um, kind of great match up um, because of the music that she was into that she wanted to bring to the show is the music that I love already and was already, you know, 
some of my favorite artists. And, and um, I also grew up in Los Angeles. And so I've, I, and I've always been, um, you know, a fan of and, and uh, you know, into the independent music scene here, especially the hip hop and the R&B stuff. So, you know, it was kind of like when we started talking about the music for the show and she was telling me about the artists and the references that she wanted to bring, it was like, oh, great. This is already my favorite stuff. So this is going to be great. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of started with that, you know, giving, having her give me the direction of like, what was her vision? And she did have a very clear vision about the music that she wanted in the show and the, the role that she wanted the music to play. Um, and I was able to just jump off of that and start feeding her, um, you know, other things that she hadn't heard yet or wasn't familiar with. And, and then over, you know, over the time, we just kind of have that conversation going back and forth about sharing music with each other and, um, you know, talking about artists that we're excited about. And um, so it was, uh, you know, that I think, of course, that probably has, a, you know, a lot to do why, with why we work together so well and, and the music come together so well, because we both kind of write on that same um, wavelength of, of stuff that we were into. And, you know, they're obviously the massive amounts of music that are coming at both of you. How is the juggle done in post and figuring out, you know, what type of music and what spot and and how to pick from it? Because it is a plethora. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we get we get it all sent over and uh, it's a lot. It's definitely, you know, more than we could ever listen to if we tried. Um, and, you know, everybody's sending us everything and and you know, which is a great place to be. And of course, but it's also, you kind of got to wade through it. And so, you know, people pitch her music um, directly, people pitch me music directly, and we both kind of, you know, weed through it and discover stuff on our own. Um, you know, I think for me, it's great to be pitched stuff from, from everybody. And it's a great resource to be able to go through it. But I also think I probably have my most success when I go and search on my own. Um, and so there's a lot of that and, and, you know, we just kind of start pulling things together and keeping lists and making sure we save, you know, things that we're really excited about. And sometimes she'll come, you know, with a song in mind already for a scene or I'll send her something and she'll know exactly where she wants to put it. Um, and then sometimes it's, you know, we're, we're going through rounds and rounds of options for a scene and I'll give her maybe, you know, sometimes it'll be 10 20 options for for a scene and eventually we'll get we'll get to the right thing and you mentioned la as a character you know uh isa d lives in inglewood and puts on a huge uh inglewood block party this year how much of the focus is trying to be on local la musicians artists it's it's a big focus for sure it's something that we you know pay a lot of attention to and make sure that we're you know, reaching out to those artists if they're not submitting their work to us, we're finding them and, um, you know, trying to get them involved. And um, we were, you know, the, the she puts on in the show, she puts on a music festival in Inglewood that's, you know, celebrating that community. So there's vendors and all, you know, all the kind of, um, you know, stores in the area, but also, you know, we made sure that we curated the artists performing in the festival to represent the area too. So all the artists are from South LA um, and, you know, have are a lot, most of them were independent and we brought a range of artists, you know, some really, really small artists to, um, you know, a bigger, you know, major label, big audience artists to be the headliner and, um, you know, it was really important to make sure that everybody, you know, represented the area and the, um, you know, the, the vibe of what the, the festival was supposed to be about. And, uh, and that we, you know, had some even kind of representation across the board. And you mentioned Major Label. I know that you guys have a soundtrack coming out for the season next week on Atlantic Records. Talk about the uh, working with them as a company and uh, her overall situation that she's made with them yeah it was uh it was really great to work with atlantic this season um we we worked with rca the past few seasons but isa um struck this label deal with atlantic where she has her radio um label through and um so we worked with you know the atlantic team which was really uh so you know great to work with and super supportive and really excited about it 
um, working with Kevin Weaver, you know, was, was great. And I'm excited, you know, all the kind of lead up to the release has been really exciting to see. Um, and then of course, you know, Issa's team that she put together, her A&R, um, and the label staff that were, um, of course, super supportive and really helpful in working on the show. And that was something that we had had in the past. So we had a little bit more resources this year to put towards, you know, creating some music. Um, we've always done that in the past, but this year we really expanded that and we held like a couple of writer camps to have people start creating music based on the show. And, um, so that was, that was a, a nice advantage to have, um, this season to be able to, um, have the, those teams kind of help and support, um, to, to create music, to find music, to, you know, help make sure the release gets the visibility that it deserves and all that. So that's interesting. I mean, writers camps, I mean, writers camps, for those who don't know, basically labels and publishers put together writers camps, like for a Rihanna record, there may be 10 writers camps and 150 songs written for her record that she chooses 12 or whatever. But a writers camp for a TV show is kind of a unique thing. Has that been done before as far as you know? Uh, I don't know. I haven't done it before. Um, you know, I, I was, I got to be part of a, of a writer's camp, um, that was put together for a record label. Um, and while I was there, I was kind of talking to some of the people and, and realized that that would be something that we could, we could definitely benefit from and probably something that we could get a lot of people to be a part of. Sure. And we had a lot of success with it. We ended up, you know, I think we probably had four or more records that made it into the show that came out of those writer sessions. Um, and they were really fun and the writers were really excited about it. And um, Issa came down to one of them and I was there at both of them and spoke to the writers and we kind of gave them a little bit of an outline of the season and the themes and storylines. And, um, and uh, we, it, it ended up being um, pretty successful. Cool. Talk about, I would assume people are like interested in being on the show artists, right? That are normally hip hop is, it can be difficult to clear sometimes just due to the amount of writers involved. Um, I would think yeah. that present a good uh, involvement, right? Yeah, definitely. People want to be a part of the show. When we, you know, approach them about using songs, for the most part, everybody, you know, wants to do what they can to <clears throat> make sure that we can clear it. Uh, a lot of times, that means you know, people negotiating splits and um, you know, things, samples that haven't been cleared and. Um, you know, fortunately, because people want to be involved in the show, they maybe they can, you know, put in the extra effort to make sure those things get done in time for us to use it. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's definitely been, um, helpful, you know, early on, we kind of had to describe it a little bit more and kind of sell it to people. But now, um, you know, it's, uh, a little bit easier, a little you, bit. You got heat, you know, they call you, that's how it works. Yeah, hopefully they, you know, they get their split settled in time. Cool. All right, well, thanks. So, uh, Ly, we're going to move to Liza Richardson now. A little show called The Watchmen, very big HBO wind-up, uh, Regina King starring role. Um, so, interesting show. I mean, I was not, I did, I, I did not read the uh, comic book series, obviously, but it's to come pick up on it and what's going on in it. There's, it's a very complex show. There's a lot going on. And musically, uh, very interesting, you know, a mix between some 50s stuff, some 80s stuff, uh, some modern stuff. Talk about the uh, mix of music in this show. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's all the music, like a lot of shows. I mean, there's some shows that they they create their own musical world, like, um, you know, shows that are really specific to a particular location. Um, I worked on Outer Banks, for example, which is on Netflix, which is takes place in North Carolina. That just kind of has a thing, you know. Watchmen is all over the universe. <laughs> you know, yeah. you've got um, rural, you've got city, you've got different time periods. Um, uh, so, so, you know, I mean, the music is going to be specific to a character, specific to a location or a scene or uh, whatever, whatever is required. It, and it could play along with or completely against. It could be the exact time frame or it could be a completely different time, you know, musical timestamp. You know, sometimes music can be 
can tell you where you are and, and help tell the story of where you are in your location or, or your character, or sometimes it can, you know, keep you off balance. And I think Damon Lindelof, the showrunner, is just um, just a genius at that, you know. Well, I like the way you used, uh, I want to say it's episode five, but it's when they, when they do the Tim Blake Nelson uh, flashback of the giant squid episode. Uh, and, and so Careless Whisper, from the <laughs> Michael Classic from 1984, gets a really interesting use in the show, actually three uses in the show. It yeah. The George Michael in period, then it gets a score use. And then it gets uh, Natalie Dawn from Pop Pamela Moose uh, doing a really nice female cover. So talk about the lineage of that and why that song was picked and how the different three different parts were laid in. I mean, one one of the things I worked with uh, Damon on the Leftovers and the Watchmen and Watchmen, and um, mm-hmm. it's it's one of the things he loves to do is repeat a song and use it over and over, and I love that. You know, I mean. I've been, I've worked on projects where it's like a crime to use a show, a song more than once, you know, but, but if you do it super intentionally, um, it, it can work. And, and Damon loves that. So gosh, I mean, why did we choose that particular one? Um, I don't know exactly, you know, Whatever we can try works. different ones and see what, what still <laughs> works, you know, but that, that one I love, I love Careless Whisper. In, in and the other world. question I have for you is the um, aspect of using 50s songs, like some really interesting stuff, which we'll show a clip about, but you use some Frank Sinatra, you use some, you know, doo-wop type stuff and some, you know, talk about that suggestion, because obviously it's not the period. Yeah. Um, you mean th- why the choices were made? Yeah, exactly. Like, in other words, you, you have a, a motif of having a number of throughout, including the clip we're about to show. And so I'm just curious, what was his thought process and yours in doing that? I don't know exactly what the, you know, I mean, it was, it was experimentation and, and trying things with picture to see what, what feels right. Um, I mean, at the be- like, take the the clip we're going to see, for example. Yeah, episode- set that up for me, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, episode one one oh six. You know, oh my God, it's the most intense episode to me. I mean, every single episode in Watchmen could be its own almost standalone film. It's um, and 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 one oh six, like a lot of the episodes, have their own characters and their own world. Um, so 106, the one we're going to see, you know, it takes place actually in, um, yeah, the early fifties, the forties. Um, so at the top, okay. So the process on, let's just take this episode, you know, as an example, but the process for for me on this was Damon comes to me at the beginning of working on, you know, script stage basically and says, okay, this, this is going to be about nostalgia, about time, and about memory, the past, um, uh, forgetting, um, remembering, trying not to forget. Um, This is the episode where Angela takes nostalgia pills and she lives through what her grandfather went through as, you know, growing up, you know, in America in, in this horrible time period. Um, being lynched or almost lynched. Um, and so she's basically feeling everything that her grandfather felt. And um, so, so you know, you're going back and forth between time. Anyway, so what I do, and I, like Kier was saying about research, I mean, the best thing about music supervision is research because you can just like, you can just nerd out. You can, I mean, that's that's my favorite part of music period is just, being able to research and dive deep, deep, deep into something, whether it's something you're really good at and you know a lot about or something that you're just totally learning about. Um, you get to just be a nerd and, and, and freak out. So anyway, um, so I just, you know, went on and gathered a ton of music of that time, but he wanted to use songs as score and as song spots throughout the episode. There's very little typical score in this episode. Um, so, so basically I, you know, I, I pull like say 60 songs that are from that time period 
that have those themes. Then they're used by the, you know, the editor wrestles around with them and, and may come to me and say, okay, you know, we're going, we're working on this particular scene. So, so then I would use some of the ideas that I've already thought of, but then I'd find other ideas eventually in the end, you know, ending up, because along the way you come, you come across all these other songs from outside that era. Um, you know, like we ended the episode with a seventies Zamrock song called living in the past, you know, so, um, you know, you just work on different ce- scenes and I mean, if you look at it on its own, it's like a big fight scene with a beautiful love song. But I mean, in the context of the show as a whole, it's it's really powerful. <laughs> yeah, no, I thought so too. It a, like you said, it's a great juxtaposition to have, you know, the ink spots. Uh, yeah. playing as and, I, and I love the spoken word aspect to it. It's so cool and it's so mellow. And, but so, yeah. I don't know. So this is a one time, this is not a series that's going forward, right? It was a- It's a one and it was, it was designed to be one, one season. Right. So and then, I mean, it may, it may go on. I mean, Watchmen is, is something like Spider-Man, you know, it, right. it's a, it could come up again. I'm sure right. it will, <laughs> but well, I don't know. Probably. It won't be this exact, you know, uh, crew. <laughs> I think my favorite- Thing was about to happen when Gene Sharp walks in and says, "Play Devo," and then I was like, "Oh, yeah. I'm gonna play all the Mongoloid." And then it's like, "No, just uh, geez, I love that." So good, so good, yeah. Anyway, great work, Liza Blake. Speaking of one-offs, um, the plot against America uh, was not familiar with the book, a Philip Roth book about the concept of what if Lindbergh, being such a popular hero in America, uh, who was an isolationist and a known anti-Semite was elected president uh, as opposed to Roosevelt's last term. What would happen? And it is scary, especially in the world we live in today. Um, so why don't you just jump in and talk about that series and the music, and then we'll get into the David Simon of, you know, your relationship after with David after. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, from a, from a music point of view, it, it, at first it seemed like it would be very straightforward. Um, and there wasn't going to be very much music. And then as we got into it, it kind of, the assignment grew and grew. Um, there, there is a large majority of the music is pretty simple um, uh, period uh, radios. Um, uh, David Simon doesn't use any score with very few exceptions. We've done 125 hours of TV together now. And, uh, there's, there was only one one of the series that had any any music created written for the show. That was um, the one about Yonkers Housing Authority. But so on this, we knew we weren't going to have a score. Um, that's a challenge when you have emotional scenes and um, scenes where you need to convey other things that you're not seeing. Um, and uh, it took a while to convince everyone that we could that we could do that. I think initially HBO thought we should have a composer. So one of the things I did early on was um, come up with some examples of ways that we could use source music to to score a scene. So you'll see at the very beginning of the of the whole show, we're going to look at the main title sequence, but the scene that immediately immediately follows that is um, a long scene where we're establishing the neighborhood and we hear a radio um, playing um, Adi Shaw, clarinet for concerto. And, but it's always, Simon is very, very um, adamant that there has to be a, an, an excuse for us to be hearing this music in the scene, unless it's a rare montage, which happens you know, once or twice per series or per season of a series. There has to be a reason. So we would, we, that's one of the things that we would kind of um, fight would be too strong of a word. But I was thinking in this case, can we just play the music? It sets the mood. It tells us we're in this year. It's great. It, it works really well for the scene. Just like we can cheat a little bit. We can just have this clarinet music playing. It's like, no, it has to be coming from a radio on the porch. It's which, which porch is it? And when we go over here, we have to hear it move to the left. All those kind of things. So we are very... Um, He's a source guy that must have a source 
to, you know, it comes from. It just can't just play. Yeah, if you're hearing music, there has to be a, a, a diegetic reason for it to be, to, to be there. Um, so, uh, you know, the, most, of the, most of the show is um, music of the period. Um, there are a lot of news reels where we, I was lucky to have some period library music that was uh, World War II news reels and stuff like that. So we could fill a lot of space without spending a lot of money there so that we could afford to use some Frank Sinatra songs and uh, Benny Goodman and a lot of more expensive music from the period. We did have a big uh, state dinner scene at the White House where we had a... Um, 12, 14 piece band come in and, and play. Uh, we recorded that band the day before and then had them do playback on set. That was a pretty big production for a, for a David Simon show, which is usually just you know some music playing in the bar in the background. We didn't see the main title. We were working on the show for like six months without even knowing it, if there would really be a main title. And then it turned out there was, and it's this montage that starts out feels kind of like a historical montage of the period and it slowly morphs into something very dark. Um, and Simon picked the, uh, this song, the, uh, the Road is Open Again, um, by Dick Powell. And it's uh, a very corny song from the period with very corny lyrics. And it's not really that fun to listen to uh, as a song. Like you feel about two bars into it, like, okay, I get this. It's like... <laughs> And, um, and the version was a version of Dick Powell and a piano singing it. And so there was a real split among all the people working on the show over whether this was a workable idea at all. And um, the thing that I thought right away was that the song, this idea for a song like this could work, but have it, it's, it's made so much less relatable by it being this scratchy old recording of just one guy at a piano. So we decided to um, make a new version of the song. So what you hear in the show is actually, again, we um, got a big band and a choir and um, an arranger, and we did all of that, uh, which is, again, unusual in David Simon's show to have uh, a bunch of production. And um, so, yeah, and I, I did all that, and um, it ended up being something that, that did did work. Um, it sells the idea. The other things I tried were, uh, I've always um, loved Carla Blaze's version of America the Beautiful. Mm. And that was something that we tried and it was just too, it was too straightforward of an idea. Um, we tried it for the end titles. It was again too straightforward of an idea. Uh, one of the great sins in David Simon's world is being on point. Like you can never be on point. You always have to be somehow in an askew relationship to what you're seeing. It's, you know, Not you never a want to put a guy, you're saying. He doesn't yeah, like you don't want to put a hat on a hat. You know, right. you, you have to, uh, you know, if, if you walk into a bar in, in, in David's world and the, the, the person of your dreams is there at the bar, they won't be playing on the jukebox a beautiful love song. They'll be playing um, 96 tears or, or something like that. You know, it's, it's always going to go against what, what you're seeing and against the story to kind of, you know, add a different layer of meaning. What's interesting about the opening titles, uh, twofold. One is that, you know, my son is always trying to fast forward through the opening titles. And like, but somehow this like stuck in his head. He's like, no, I want to hear that again. I love the images and I love the, I love the song. And in my research, reading about it, it was actually a song that was written for the FDR and uh, NRA, um, you know, the New Deal, basically a song of a patriotic, you know, come out again and we're, we're back and we're doing this for the country. And, you know, you guys flipped it and used it kind of both ways. It's patriotic for America, but yet it's a patriotic for Germany. So I see what you're saying about the juxtaposition. Interesting. Well, it starts out as a kind of rah, rah patriotic song, and then it kind of falls apart and gets a bit dissonant. I added layers after we recorded the whole band and everything brought it back to the studio and I added layers of sounds and crowds. And um, at the very end, as it fades out, you hear, I took a chant from the um, Ilhan Omar's, um, when Trump, the Trump rally where the crowd was chanting, send her back. I took that sound and laid it in under the end. You, you hear yeah. that. Oh, good to have a sound guy as a music supervisor, huh? Yeah, yes, yeah. We, you know, every, we use whatever. <laughs> 
whatever tools we can get our hands on to um, and it's judge true, his work. Yeah. Is it true that the actor who played the movie theater owner is the guy who does the vocals? That's right. Yeah. Um, yes. We. Right, he's I've, I go to well, cat. Uh, he's um, he's uh, Michael Kostroff. He's uh, he's been in a lot of David stuff. He was um, played Levy, the lawyer in The Wire. Right. Oh, and uh, and he's actually a, he is also a Broadway singer. So right, yeah, that's a. It's funny. You're right. It feels cheesy, but the images make it so powerful with the connection between the you know America's the NRA movement after uh, the depression into Nazi Germany's rise. Uh, it's really an interesting juxtaposition. So speaking of you know him diving deep, Simon and you uh, obviously Treme going to school in New Orleans and you know knowing a lot of the music community. That show was a true deep dive into New Orleans musicians' lives after Katrina, where Wendell Pierce played the main character. So, but it's a very much a town of rejecting outsiders and really not suffering fools gladly, if you will, as far as making sure that you represent correctly for the music. So that, uh, I want you to talk about that for a minute on Treme, and for those who haven't seen it, try to look that show up because it's really a really well executed show and great musical fabric to it. Well, um, I, my, I had family who lived in New Orleans. I'd spent quite a bit of time in New Orleans before we worked on that show. Um, so I knew the, the music and the community and, and David is a huge New Orleans music fan and Eric Overmeyer, the other co-show creator, um, they're both like, uber new orleans nerds and so we we knew the material we weren't um coming from the outside um to convince people of that it was an uphill battle at first um and i was there like you know telling brass bands my sister painted uncle lionel's drum you know and, and, and I know. Like, okay you're in you know i mean i had weird small personal connections to the music community um, and, and by the time we, um, we were, we got into production seriously, we kind of won the music community over and people trusted us. Also, people are happy to get paid. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in, in terms of getting creative collaborators and, you know, you can go and dangle money in any, in any city and people of course will come and work with you. But we, um, over the course of three and a half seasons, we did really establish a strong relationship with the music community there. And that was part of the reason we did the show. The, the whole idea of the show was to put money in the pockets of New Orleans musicians and get them back on their feet after the storm. Yeah, kudos for that to Simon and you for doing that because you really did an excellent job of making it feel really authentic. There's one other thing I just wanted to mention about last year, which was at the same time we were doing this show about an alternate reality, rise of fascism in America in 1940. We were also doing this show about pornography in New York in 1984. They were in production <laughs> at the same time. And we would go back and forth sometimes on the same day from like set, you know, this like sleazy bar in Times Square with uh, sex workers. And you're like, okay, we have to be out in New Jersey at the beer hall with the uh, fascist. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, that show you're talking about, that show you're talking about is The Deuce, right? Yeah, The Deuce. The the Deuce. Deuce. I love that show. We have a question from the chat, and that is, can you tell us how Elvis Costello, this year's girl duet, came about in The Deuce, uh, how it was recorded, et cetera? It's such a killer version of the song. Uh, why was it never released? Um, uh, it came about, uh, you know, we had all these discussions and you know arguments and battles uh, about um, gender stuff with, and specifically relating to the music. I really fought long and hard to have a, a woman's voice in the main title in season two and that had never happened on David Simon show before and uh, the compromise that we arrived at was the Elvis song as a, as a duet and then on season three we have um, Debbie Harry singing the song. So that was why we were looking in that direction. The, the Elvis song worked so great. And so we thought, what if we made a new version that reinterpreted it as a du duet between a man's voice and a woman's voice? It wasn't released because, um, you know, we uh, kind of lost, we're just so busy. And, um, you know, the promotion and marketing of things isn't really, uh, 
at the forefront of what we're thinking about. We're always rushing on to the next project. We also did an amazing um, work with Debbie Harry at the end of the Deuce. Blondie, uh, I arranged with, um, with uh, Chris from Blondie. Uh, we recorded a new version of, um, uh, what's that song? The Sidewalks of New York. And uh, Debbie Harry is singing it, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's one of the greatest things, music moments in a David Simon show or that I've ever been involved with, was uh, to take this old chestnut, this corny song from the beginning of the 20th century and make it into a kind of 80s ballad. And, uh, and Debbie is singing with a, you know, it's kind of like, a, she sounds like someone who's lived in New York and in Times Square and seen all that stuff go on. So if you never got to see that, it's worth checking out. The end of the do. Watch that. Watch it. No, it hasn't been released either because we're just like, yeah, someone should release that, but we don't. It's just uh, busy it's making. It um, and also, if anybody has questions in the chat, please, uh, or has questions, please put them in the chat, and uh, they'll get to us um, as long as it's you know topical what we're talking about. So thank you. Last thing, I'm still talking. I just want to say to the other three music supervisors, congratulations on your work. When I looked, I went and looked at your stuff today and I realized like, Man, HBO and congrats to HBO too. I mean, they're doing good work and these are all, these shows are all um, really, you know, strong, I mean, strong music, strong ideas. And yay HBO, right guys? That's, hey, that's true. Uh, and alone. <laughs> So, Thank you, HBO. As I was mentioning <laughs> earlier on, my when the show debuted, my 18-year-old said to my daughter, said, Dad, I'm going to watch the show. you got to leave. And I was like, what are you talking about? This is my house. And she's like, no, I just don't want to watch this show. And I was like, what is it? She said, it's euphoria. I said, what is it about? She says, well, you know, the girl's got some issues and, you know, she's, she's got problems. And <laughs> some I, issues. I'm comfortable with you watching it with me. And I was like, okay, great. So after she was done and went to sleep, I snuck down and watched it because I wanted to know. Um, and so, Jen, so obviously I saw you and Sam Levinson, the, the creator showrunner, do a panel last year at our at GMS education event, talking about his personal struggles and his backstory uh, and how he utilized the stuff to make this show. Um, so can you just talk about uh, working with him first and that relationship and how, you know, this show is why it works so well and the music highlights it is it's real and Zendata is amazing and the performances are amazing so just talk a little bit about him and you and that process um yeah thank you um I came on board with Sam um through one of the producers who I worked with on Atlanta and then who I worked with on Basket so she's kind of a goddess um and okay. yeah she's she's the best she's made my career so um and when I met with them, it was just it was just a very easy conversation. I mean, I didn't really go in. I saw the pilot and was just kind of like, okay, that's a lot of fucking music. But, you know, I didn't really go in with any sort of playlist or anything like that because I just wanted to hear what he had to say and what his vision was. And it's kind of, you know, not that it's all over the place in a bad way, but we just, you know, we use music to help tell the story, to help create the mood to kind of have it be like a kind of like a character almost kind of like the makeup like we were talking before before the zoom started so why don't you reference, um, that, again? Why don't you reference that again because i thought that was cool. yeah so so i went to after the show aired billy eilish played at the greek and i went and like all of the girls had like euphoria makeup on it was very very <laughs> cute um but you know the one of the challenges of the show was that Sam wrote all the episodes and he was directing all of them except two. And so it was really kind of like his time was very limited as the showrunner, producer, director, um, writer. So I worked very, very closely with the editors and was there in post every day. Well, not every day, but it almost felt like every day. Um, just working through different scenes, seeing the daily, seeing how everything was put together. Because also, if I didn't do that, they would run wild and put $5 million worth of music in an episode. So I kind of had to... You like, got to police the project. I had to, I had to get in front of that, but also, you know, maintain Sam's vision. Sam has amazing music taste, and he's open. He's game for anything. And that's what made it so much fun to kind of 
be able to pitch stuff out of left field. And our editors had such great taste in music and they knew how to, how to work with music. Our music editors were very much working with the score. That was kind of their, um, their main thing that uh, our music editors w- would sometimes cut music to present to Sam, which sometimes people, you know, you'd have to take the iPad to him during lunch and be like, okay, which songs do you like the best? And I'd get a napkin with everything written that he wanted. Um, so it was, you know, the, the, it was our editors and it was, you know, obviously Sam's vision um, that we just, it was a lot, but it was just using music I think like we all do just to help tell the story, maybe connect with our audience in, in a different way, or maybe say something about the scene or about the show or about the environment or that world that isn't kind of set in dialogue. Right. And um, also, you know, the fact that Drake is a producer on the show. Um, talk about how he got involved and, and does he weigh in at all on, on any music? Because he, he knows a little about music. And he certainly does make a lot. No, Drake, um, Drake had nothing to do with the music um, except letting us, giving us a break on using his song. We got a little bit of a discount on that one. A little. Um, but it, he, he was more of, I don't know how he got involved. He just was more of like a figurehead and champion of the show in general. Um, Just, you know, supporting it and believing it and just very much an executive producer um, position. But no, he didn't didn't have anything to do with the music. I think he really liked it though. So that's good. (laughs) I hope he liked it. So yeah, the diversity of the music, obviously you have a lot of different flavors from, you know, all over the map, including the... uh, clip that we're going to show and, and hopefully um uh talk about the diversity of the musical direction of the show and is it just best song best slot or how do you guys go about your business in that respect it's definitely best song best slot um you know obviously when they're at parties we kind of you know s- stick to that kind of the you know trap hip-hop type music but when you have a s- an episode like you know, six, which is the Halloween episode, where it's just wall to wall music, they're at a party the whole time. We had to kind of, it was just a big puzzle, not only for the budget, but also like, when are we going to kind of give, give, give the audience like a break from the hip hop? And how can we do that in a way that kind of, that, that is still connected and keeps it all in the, in the same family. It was just, it was just a puzzle. And so by trying different things and with our editors and the way that they, they uh, assembled the show, we were able to kind of, you know, pull different things from different genres and kind of use like when actually Blake, this made me thought, think of you. So in, in one of the episodes, Rue in this party episode, Rue is threatening uh, one of the kids that's hitting on uh, her little sister. And she's like, I forget exactly what she said. She's like, I will talk to all the people in rehab. I will get Omar and Rebe. And she starts rattling off all the names of the wire. I don't know if anybody caught that, but it was really funny. <laughs> anyway, we used the, the JID song and it was kind of perfect because it started off as like score, like here exactly how your song functioned as kind of building up that tension. I think it, it, was, it was very, very similar. And so mm-hmm. we were able to, to do that and then kind of create this tension of her threatening and don't fuck with my sister, go tell her she's pretty. And then, you know, and then we're back in the party or, you know, early in that episode, we used a song from this artist called the Dreamliners for a 1960s Chicana girl group that mostly did background vocals for male artists. And so we were, you know, we were able to use that sandwiched in between, I don't even remember, but two, you know, two straight up hip hop songs. So party songs. So it was just being able to kind of weave in and out of like diegetic and non-diegetic and not, not make your ears tired, if that makes sense. So by episode eight, we were all very tired. <laughs> and we just, you know, it was, it was the culmination of, um, of everything. It's such a pivotal point in the show where you're, there's so many different beats 
that you're hitting to kind of the reveal of, of her father dying and the sweatshirt that she wears the whole time. You find out that that was his sweatshirt and her getting into the drugs. And it's just a really big emotional montage. And it was just kind of one of those things where we had it. We're like, what are we going to do? I don't know. Like, what, 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 what do we do? Because again, with the, the way that we, the style of the show being having everything from Randy Newman to a Megan The Stallion to, you know, the air supply placement. Um, it was kind of very much a sit down. It's like, where do we start? And it was just a late night. And this one popped up. I mean, cause we're all, the, you know, the, Julio, Sam, myself are just, you know, on our computers trying to just play stuff. And this one we just put up and it hit every single beat without one music edit whatsoever. And so it was definitely one of the ones that was like placed in. We're like, okay, good. Can we go home now? Because this is fucking perfect. I think so, they call music supervisor gold right there. Good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're like, yeah, uh, that's I, like. Um, so yeah, it's just, you know, it's a beautiful song and it's uh, very poignant. Um, Fantastic show. So a uh, question for you from the uh, chat is, let me stop here, and is uh, Labyrinth. Uh, Labyrinth's work on the show. Talk about how that happened and what that process is like. So Sam um, had a relationship with Labyrinth's manager, and he's always been a fan, and I, I they met at a party. and. Sam just, I, I think he said he wanted like Hans Zimmer meets like Kanye West or something like with gospel choir and Labyrinth was like, yeah, I totally get it. So he came on board. He was, um, you know, he's a first time composer and he was in the UK. So we both, you know, we both kind of had our own lanes. We both had very, we had our own shit to deal with on both sides. So. Um, but he would send so much music to us and to the editors and they would kind of slot it in and they, you know, Sam loves to like fuck with stems and play stuff backwards and just really kind of mix it up, slow it down. Um, so, but we would send him the scenes and then, you know, and he would come back. And a lot of times I was just dealing with all of my stuff. So, um, you know, we didn't really have traditional spotting sessions because he was in the UK, Sam was shooting, we were always behind schedule. So, um, but he came on board to answer your question through, through a relationship with Sam. Got it. And um, another question that came up from the uh, chat was, uh, how many cues do you figure you listen to to get to that Donny Hathaway? That's- well, by that time, you know, by that time we had kind of like a bunch of playlists and stuff that I maybe had submitted for other scenes. Um, I don't, I don't really remember, but I don't think we tried that many. It wasn't like, oh, on the 50th one. Like, I think this was probably one of the the first ones that we tried. Um, you know, this wasn't a week long search. This was maybe like a couple days and it was like. Like I said, it was just that late night. Like we have to get something in here. We have to, you know, figure this out. It's too important, and 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 you know, it happened. Yeah. Well, it's 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 good. You got to a nice place. I highly encourage everybody to go listen to the original, also by Leon Russell. He wrote it in 1970, and then uh, Donnie recorded it in 1972, I think. And believe it or not, it was never a single. Never released as a single that Donnie had to release. Yeah, I mean, you know, the other thing that was interesting, too, is, first of all, when Zendaya saw it, she got crazy emotional because that was a song that was actually very important to her and her father. So there was that element. And then Donny Hathaway was, you know, a very tortured soul as well. So that wasn't something that we were looking for or was intentional. It just kind of all happened. So it was a very much this was meant to be type music moment. Yeah, it was beautiful. And that's, look, the, what we do is, you know, I still remember some great placements in my life. And, and what we do is, you know, we do it, we, we do this job not to get rich because it doesn't pay that well, but it's an amazing gig when it's working and you're working with great people and you're working on great projects and you can place great music and work with great composers. It's a genius world. So 
you know, you just never forget some of those legendary placements in your life. And, you know, I'm sure all of us have the draw, which is the song that we love or the songs we love and are just praying someday find that right mm -hmm. thing to get that thing put in there somewhere. Um, oh, yeah. A couple more questions. We just passed the hour mark, but a couple more questions. Um, one is kind of a good one for, you know, Blake comes from sound, Jen comes from PR, Liza was a DJ. I came from the record business. Here just was born into music supervision. <laughs> <laughs> just out the womb. Just right out the womb. <laughs> uh, into a spotting session. <laughs> <laughs> we landed in a spot session. But <laughs> who've come from second careers, uh, the question is, you know, for people maybe really inspired by the stuff we do and wanting to get into it, um, what are some of your recommend and, and for young people too, I mean, what are some of the recommendations for start with the second career first of, you know, people who really love what we do and would love to get a part of it, uh, just go around the room and give your advice about you know, whether it's a first timer or, or someone who's coming from another business that can apply, like Liza, when you talked about being a music nerd, you know, I started as a college DJ and just you dive into stuff and, you know, the research that you do and um, finding out more things about music and that you can utilize in your craft, you know, talk about the process and what your recommendations you would have for people who would love to get into it. I, I mean, nerding out, number one, just getting deep, going super very, you know, all the way in on research and passion and everything. That's important. Um, obviously, learning, you know, obviously creative isn't the whole job, as we all preach all the time and remind people that, that it's sort of a misconception to think that it's completely creative. Um, so you've got to learn the other stuff. I, I think good advice, I, I hope, I don't know, is to help your friends. If, if you know of somebody who is working on a film, I, uh, um, whether it's a student film or an independent or, I, I think I kind of started by, I, and I had some friends that were in advertising and I, I just, threw music at them and said, try this on your spot. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel like there's so many different ways to approach trying to get in. I, I also think these days, it seems like, I could be wrong. What do you guys think? Um, it seems like, you know, a good way to start is to try to work for uh, an established music supervisor um, to learn. I mean, I, I feel like you can learn a lot in... 30 days, you know, uh, rather, you know, classes are probably helpful too. Um, I would think, but, but when you're, when you're in the trenches, you see how things get done <clears throat> and you see how the dots are connected and whether it's your, you know, your contacts and who to go to for certain types of music or certain prices, that kind of thing. That's all very, you know, super important. What do you guys think? I, I, I mean, I, I go ahead. I just because I, you know, I did PR for many years, got crazy burnt out, and this is my second career. And I moved out here with the, you know, acceptance that I would have to start at the bottom and intern because nobody was going to hire me to do something that I didn't know how to do. And, you know, some, I, I don't know if it's still old school, but you know, it is the entertainment industry. And I believe that you work from the bottom up because this is a business and understanding that this is a business and, you know, you're kind of running a department on a television show. You're not just picking out cool music. Like, yes, that's the really fun part, but, you know, I think exactly what Liza said, like just, just interning. I, I, that's how I did it. And understanding this is a business. And the first piece of advice that Dave Jordan, my first boss ever gave me, which is the best piece of advice I've ever gotten was learn how to do your own clearance. Oh, that's so, that's, those are, those are my, that's, those are my words of wisdom. Uh, I'll give an example recently. Um, this is a great story. So one of my students at American university was like, so crushed his internship got taken, you know, crushed by the, the pandemic and he was nothing to do. And I said, look, man, you know how to shoot, right? He said, yeah. I said, you know how to edit, right? He said, yeah. I go, go make a film. 
go make me a five minute film. Maybe it's, you know, about an altruistic topic, something important in the world and come back to me. So he goes and makes a film about this suicide hotline uh, called Boys Town, which I knew nothing about. It's a Midwestern uh, suicide hotline that's very, very popular and very important. And, you know, I give him a bunch of notes and he goes back and does, you know, um, he does a bunch of edits on it and makes it better. And then I said, what are you going to do with the music? He says, I, I don't know. And so, well, I said, you know, so-and-so who's in the program also? He's a composer? Nope. So I connect those two, put them together in a spot, a Zoom spot session online. They do a spotting session and he delivers the music. So now the composer has a credit on a movie. The director has free music. And then I said, what about a music supervisor? And he's like, well, uh, I said, do you want to use a song at the end? He said, yeah, I'd love to. I said, well, send me an idea of what you would like vibe-wise. So he sends me a couple of like disparate, you know, just different, very different things. And I said, all right, just give me, pick a lane here. Like, give me something a little closer. So he gives me two ideas. And there was a girl who had reached out to me who wanted to be a music supervisor. And she was young and she works at YouTube. And, and uh, so I just said, look, you want to be a music supervisor, right? So I said, look, watch these lectures. Here's how to do music licensing. Um, take these two songs and go find bands out there that are 100% own their own music. And come back to me with two, two or three different songs that could work in this context. So she did that. Uh, he liked two of the songs. She ended up, I said, told her what letter to write, how to write them, give her the clearance form, how to do it, get a gratis use for a student film. She got it done. And he was incredibly happy. And she got her first, she's going to get her first music credit on a, on a short film. So that level of initiative Again, it's sometimes you can find someone like me to hook you up, but otherwise you have to do it on your own. Every day there are people making student films and every day people need music help on them, whether it's scoring or clearing music. So be that resourceful person if you really want it. There's so much work you have to do into it. Um, so that's just one example that happened recently. Uh, who else? Anybody else? Blake, second career coming from sound. You did sound with some really small directors, like I mentioned at the beginning. <laughs> How did that segue into music supervision and what can you recommend? No, I mean, I didn't, for me, it was always all mixed together during music and sound. I started out as a musician and studied film and music in college and then got a job working for a sound company at the very bottom um, in, when I moved to LA at age 20. Um, I don't feel like I have a lot of useful advice that's, that's practical in terms of the industry because I got into music supervising. I had no idea what I was doing and I fell into it on, on a show that just then became an amazing show. The Wire was the first time I'd ever been a music supervisor. Uh, and I, I mostly worked with David Simon who exists outside the industry. We both, you know, we really were outside of it. This is the most time I've ever spent in my life with other music supervisors. It's yeah. fantastic. I could do it more. Um, <laughs> nice to see you. We're so fun. We're so fun. <laughs> I do think your advice, John, the main thing is just, if there's a thing that you want to do, just go and do it. You know, don't wait for anyone to give you an opportunity. I mean, and that is more possible now than it's ever been. Certainly, uh, if you're interested in music and making music, you don't need anyone's permission to do that. You can just go and do it. And I mean, find some Im images and sounds and put them together and, and tell a story. Um, it, that Doing the work itself is more possible than it's ever been before. When I started out in, in the film business, that you, there was nothing that you could do on your own. You had to have connections or a rich family member. I mean, you couldn't even join the Editor's Guild unless you had a parent who was in the Editor's Guild when I started doing it. But wow. this would be a piece of advice. Join the Guild of Music Supervisors. There you go, friend of the Guild. Like, you have like a sort of junior friends of the Guild program. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so do, the, do the work and make connections any way you can. That's, that's yeah, friends of the Guild, just for people really the, the beginning is basically a $100 a year contribution to our nonprofit and it gets you access to all of our events uh, and all our Zoom panels and information about them because we'll probably be moving to more private model. So, um, so yeah, that's the best thing to do. And just sign up on the website, guild of music supervisors.com on the friend of the guild, on friend of the guild, uh, as a friend of the guild. So, I do the, the, um, the, I mean, we're, the world is in such a, such a, it's so hard to tell the future. It feels very, uh, very difficult to tell young people 
to give advice to young people, you know. Um, it's, uh, but I, I mean, I hope that if we all survive for, for past this November, that the, the way people get access to, to media and to telling stories is changing in, in a good way, I hope. And I hope that happens more and more. And I can only see that being a good thing and creating opportunities for other kinds of people to tell stories than the ones who have gotten to up till now. Yeah, I we're agree. not in caves. So in we're about seventy-five minute mark. Um, so we're going to shut it down. But I do what want. To... Here? What's that? What about need Kier's advice? Oh, you want to hear? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you, wanna hear. Yeah. you guys, you guys said all the good things. I mean, I, you know, I started okay. as an intern also. Uh, so that's my first recommendation to people. But of course, then it's like, why do you get an internship? And then, you know, I always just kind of, you know, like kind of what you guys were saying about just connecting with people, do things on your own, have something to, you know, show that you've done or, you know, just kind of connecting with supervisors and letting them know you're out there offering to help. You know, I, people maybe aren't going to respond to you, but you might get lucky and somebody might respond to you and give you some advice. And, you know, I had a random, you know, my cousin lived in a building with another music supervisor and mentioned me to them and they invited me to come meet them and be, and I ended up being their intern. And then that was my mentor. And, you know, so you just not kind of never know, but you got to put it no. out there. The old, uh... It's a hustle. It's a hustle for all of us that are independents too. We're, I think we're always hustling to get the next yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> it is a hard lane, but again, it can be incredibly rewarding and uh, we just love what we do and we want to just make sure that you, we educate and obviously we'll continue to do these panels. Um, next week, our New York chapter on it, we're doing a special panel on Monday at 3.30 PST um, about wellness. And obviously in the pandemic and what's happened in our, you know, with the um, society in flux, shall we call it, um, people are just edgy and people are, you know, looking for answers and, and just, it's a weird time. So we're going to do a wellness panel, uh, which, um, you can register for on, on Monday at three 30 at the New York, uh, chapter, Rebecca Grierson, who's also a Pilates teacher, um, has put together for us with some really great speakers. And then again, starting next Thursday, we will do a panel, um, with composers and supervisors put on by Apple. The following week, one from Netflix and then one from Amazon, and then we'll continue. And then uh, the week after that, Hunter George will do one about the aspect of breaking into music supervisor with some young coordinators and associate supervisors. So we have a lot in store for you, and uh, we really thank you for your time. And um, to the panelists, <laughs> love. Thank you guys for your time, and have a great <laughs> rest of your Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.